Good morning from St. Bart's in Midtown Manhattan. My name is Peter Thompson. I serve as the vicar here, and it is my delight to welcome you to the forum where each week we explore important issues at the intersection of faith and the modern world. Over the next few weeks and months, we'll be toggling back and forth between sessions of the forum that are held in person and sessions that are held online based on the preferences and availability of our speakers. Whether we're in person or online, there will always be a way to view the forum in person in the Great Hall. This morning, as we prepare to observe what some call Indigenous Peoples Day and others call Columbus Day, we're honored to welcome historian and author Lawrence Burgreen to help us wrestle with the historical figure of Christopher Columbus and make sense of both his serious flaws and his impressive accomplishments. Lawrence is the author of several books, including biographies of explorers Marco Polo, Ferdinand Magellan, and Francis Drake. And of course, he's also the author of Columbus, The Four Voyages, about which he'll be speaking today. Lawrence, it's a great honor to have you with us. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to join you this morning. So tell us about this man that, uh, that we will be celebrating or reviling tomorrow, or perhaps both. You know, if you had to write an encyclopedia definition of Columbus, it would change almost from year to year, maybe even from month to month. Our, the evolution of our understanding of Columbus is, uh, it, you know, changed rapidly. I remember when I was a kid, uh, Columbus Day was a holiday that one celebrated almost without thinking. As, as a patriotic holiday, nobody really thought of Columbus as being stained with any sort of uh, shortcomings uh, the way he is now. Um, but in the 70s, this began to change. Um, and there was a reevaluation of Columbus and others like him, um, the whole idea of imperialism and of conquest. Now, I, I have to main, I have to uh, um, state that, you know, we're going to talk about some awful things that are associated with Columbus. Nevertheless, he was still and remains the most important explorer and the most accomplished explorer of all. That doesn't mean he was the best person or the most morally superior or anything like it. But without Columbus, our world would be dramatically different because he was the first to be able to go back and forth across the Atlantic. And he did it not once, but four times with almost no loss of life. So he was a phenomenal, um, you know, once, once in a millennium uh, navigator. Um, what he was not was a terrific administrator. Um, and then the way he um, lost his uh, uh, bearings um, is fascinating because he went from being an explorer to a, a mystic and then uh, kind of a self-involved um, uh, conquistador um, and, and, and deteriorated dramatically over the course of the four voyages. Now, we all study the first voyage in school. In my opinion, that's the most boring. Um, in 1492, Columbus and his crew, as we all know, go to they, what they feel is the new world, and then they come back, and they think they've been to China. Uh, remember, Columbus not only never set foot in America, he never even knew it existed. So we're living in a country with about 160 places and monuments named for Columbus. And if he had come back today, if he came back today and looked around and saw what had been done in his name and what people think of him, he would be flabbergasted because his main goal was to get to China. And when he got to the Caribbean and he began to see some of the what we now call the indigenous people there, the Taino and other Indians, um, he thought that they were some sort of Chinese people. And then he was on the outskirts of China. So he was hopelessly misguided about where he was. Well, how could this, this happen? This was not unique to Columbus. He was not, um, you know, uh, uh, foolish uh, all on his own. Um, in Europe, nobody was aware of the Pacific Ocean. Or if they were, they didn't realize how huge it was. It is, of course, the largest body of water on the planet. And uh, that, that makes a big difference. And um, Columbus wasn't aware of it. He didn't realize that his goal, his destination uh, lay beyond uh, the, the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, so his idea of what the world was like, of the shape of the world, 
which was shared by almost everybody in Europe, was wildly distorted. Um, I have a, some slides here. Let's let's take some some uh, look at them, and I'll give you some idea of uh, what how things look to Columbus. So we can go to the next one if you wouldn't mind. Moving along. Um, <laughs> This is not Columbus. <laughs> Everybody, this is everybody's idea of Columbus. This is the Columbus that appears on the covers of books um, that is in the muse- uh, in the uh, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's not Columbus. Well, for one thing, Columbus had red hair, and he was known for his red hair. There's no red hair in this picture. This is probably a prosperous merchant of Genoa, which is the city where Columbus was from. So the misunderstandings of Columbus. They are, you know, begin really at the beginning. Um, there, there's a lot of debate about, well, where was he really from? Um, we, we, we know he's from Genoa because his, his family background and his large family is heavily documented um, in, in church records, and uh, there's not much doubt about it. Nevertheless, there are counterfactual theories, and there have been about Columbus for decades, um, that he was Portuguese that he was Polish, um, that uh, he was any one of a number of other uh, nationalities. Um, Nevertheless, um, you know, there's no proof at all. Um, The only proof really is that he is from Genoa, and that's that's very well documented. And that makes sense because the Genoese were um, a seafaring city-state, and uh, Columbus got into the family business, which was um, um, merchant, uh, basically a merchant marine, um, only he had a greater ambition. So if we could just go on to the next slide. Um, and uh, the, these were the people who eventually became his sponsors. Now, he couldn't get patronage at home like many people. So he went to Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain and, um, you know, very devout. Um, this was the era uh, the Spanish Inquisition was coming. Um, and uh, so they were looking for people who would extend their vir- vision of uh, what the world would be like of a Christian world. And uh, Columbus fitted the bill. Columbus was always very pious. Um, I don't think anybody ever doubted his his piety, um, which he sometimes took to extreme. Um, so it, it was a natural fit for him to go to uh, Ferdinand and Isabella. So the the next slide, please. Uh, here, here we see we get some idea of the ships uh, that Columbus sailed, how small they were, and how simple they were. And uh, when you realize the daunting task that was before him was to sail across a body of water that no one, to our knowledge, had successfully traversed before. Um, in uh, all kinds of weather without any significant navigation equipment, only uh, uh, simple um, uh, navigation, uh, reading the clouds, the stars, the tides, and so on. Um, it's really an incredible feat. Uh, so Columbus was um, had incredible courage. We're, we're going to get to the negative side of the ledger eventually, but, you know, let's on the positive side. Uh, let's give him extraordinary courage uh, for it attempting to do this because it, it seemed almost suicidal um, that he would uh, undertake a, a mission like this. Um, he, and he wasn't doing this initially uh, for wealth or glorification. He was doing this um, in the name of the church um, and for Ferdinand and Isabella. Um, so he saw himself as uh, their instrument. In fact, throughout his life, he saw himself as God's instrument. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about... I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not a uh, uh, expert on the on the age of faith, but you know, faith was. We can say for sure a lot more powerful a force in Columbus's era than it is today. Um, Columbus often talks about hearing the voice of God. Um, and that sounds that would strike us now if we, we heard that from somebody as being, you know, perhaps a, a somewhat eccentric statement. In Columbus's time, that was not. Um, and uh, he, he, write, he wrote down in his 
notes in his diaries uh, the words and the statements that God made to him, uh, reassurances and challenges. Um, so we, we get some idea of his thinking. Now you can say, well, he was projecting and blah, 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 and this and that. But there's no doubt that Columbus was totally sincere um, in his in his faith. And uh, that was um, impelling him uh, to do this. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, we, we have here, um, you know, some, some idea of his, the, in, in the margins, some, some sex sketches that he made of his books, but let's, let's go on to the next slide, which will be a little more interesting. Ah, this is who Columbus wanted to see, uh, Kublai Khan, when he sailed across the Atlantic on his first voyage, and actually the first three voyages, um, he wanted to meet Kublai Khan. Who was he? Well, he had read about Kublai Khan along with the rest of the world in the pages of Marco Polo's travels. The only difference, uh, the only problem was these travels had occurred about 150 years earlier. So uh, Kublai Khan was long gone. Um, and if Com Columbus had by some uh, magic uh, uh, pre prestidigitation uh, gotten there, he, he would never have found Kublai Khan. Uh, so C Columbus was, dis despite his brilliance in some ways, was was very illogical. It never occurred to him that this figure that Marco Polo had written about long before uh, was now deceased. He saw the past as a perpetual present, if you will. Okay, next slide. Um, <laughs> Um, this was a, an idea, a, a, a schematic to give some idea of what Columbus thought it was like to, to him um, when he was uh, sailing to uh, China. Um, imagine that uh, you, you were sailing from New York and your goal um, was L.A., was Hollywood. Um, and uh, but um, you were told by, by that once you got to a large body of water, uh, you would be there. Um, and uh, this is this is how Columbus uh, was deceived or deceived himself. Um, he uh, thought that um, he once he reached halfway across or not, not even halfway across the country, um, he across the Atlantic, rather, he was um, he, he had reached his goal of China. It would be like traveling across the, this country, getting to Cleveland and thinking that you can you see Lake Erie and you say, oh, that must be the Pacific and you're you're in Hollywood. But of course, you're nowhere close. So his he was very everybody in Europe was challenged geometrically. Um, Columbus was the first one to really deal with it directly um, because he was uh, going further out than anybody else. OK, next slide, please. Um, this, this is what this is what this is what Columbus was was looking for. He was looking for uh, beautiful islands. Um, he did eventually find them um, in the Caribbean, thinking that they were on the outskirts of China. Um, but he also found people who were, and we'll get to them in a second, initially well disposed to Columbus. Uh, when he showed up, um, he was regarded as the fulfillment of a prophecy um, by the, the local tribes there, by Taino and others. And so his first initial interactions with them, this is very poignant, um, were very positive. Um, but they, they turned sour later when uh, you know, the, the expectations uh, differed. Um, next slide, please. Um, I just want to give you an idea of how this area looked from satellite. This is from a photograph of the Caribbean from a NASA satellite. And you can see, well, first of all, it's beautiful. And you can see how the men on his voyage would think on the three ships, would think that they were in, in some sort of paradise. And uh, how it was actually, you know, pretty easy to sail. It was fairly navigable. Um, he didn't know where he was, but, you know, he, he was able to get around. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay. 
here's here's her, his first voyage the tracks for all four voyages are similar um as you can see he never gets to north america on this voyage or any other he he gets to the caribbean and then he gets to central america um and he goes a little bit further south um and uh, some of the subsequent vo voyages but he has no idea of what he thinks of, of uh, what we associate with columbus which is the united states and uh, so despite the fact that we have so many uh, state capitals and companies and major uh, monuments not, uh, named for him um, there was really no direct connection it's it's one of the i think craziest uh, disconnects uh, in history i can't think of anything else of another figure who uh, you know was <laughs> Uh, erroneously uh, you know gave his name to so many uh landmarks it's 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 really quite extraordinary um why did this happen well um at the time columbus sailed uh and afterwards um as as this country was beginning to try and shape its history and especially in the 19th century um, there was a search for origins um, for some original discoverer now of course the country had already been discovered because it was filled with indigenous peoples you know columbus was not the first and his men were not the first people here they were already hundreds of thousands if not millions of uh, tribes and uh, so he was he was an intruder if you will um but um they uh and nevertheless in 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 our eurocentric uh view uh see him as as the first one uh to arrive okay next next slide please um <laughs> Uh, this this is a an, a, a, an early map of what uh, Columbus thought he saw uh, when he arrived in the in the New World. But but let's let's go on to the next slide. Um, um, when he arrived in the New World, you can see, especially in the picture on the right, that the relations with and these are artists' somewhat fanciful uh, uh, conceptions uh, with the indigenous people um, were calm. They were peaceful. Um, you wouldn't suspect uh, that there was a great deal of violence uh, to come. They seemed like um, you know very. Uh, the appealing um, almost romantic encounters and and that's how it was originally um, when columbus looked on these his first impressions and we know what he thought because he wrote about them at length when when he looked on these people initially he was struck by um, how well formed they were um, how intelligent they were um, and uh, of course skillful sailors um and how uh, dutiful they were now then, then something strange happened keep in mind in italy at that time slavery was common uh, many people in italy owned slaves who could afford it on second thought when columbus looked at these people he thought oh you know they might make terrific slaves now this was a violation of his of his uh, orders or commission because he was uh, so his main goal if he encountered people was to convert them to christianity this is something that we often lose sight of um in the in the west in our secularized culture in many parts around the world um especially in the east um, no matter how many atrocities are associated with columbus he is still regarded uh, first and foremost as the bringer of christianity to the philippines uh, or some other area where it got there indirectly um and that and that is the most important thing about him and tends to i don't know if excuse is the right word um, but cover up or or obscure um, any foibles he had so um in 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 many parts of the world that is what columbus is known for we have a much more complicated and unresolved uh, relationship with columbus than uh, those other parts of the world okay next next slide please 
Um, this is a picture. I, th I think I took this one. Um, I went to uh, one of his first landing sites, which is, of course, named for Queen Isabella uh, by Columbus. And, and it was, uh, we don't really know where he first landed in the Caribbean. Um, he tended to obscure his uh, uh, his um, trajectory. Well, why did he do that? If if his maps fell into the hands of other people, of rivals, um, he didn't want them to know about it. So this often made it a little bit hard to figure out exactly where Columbus's track left uh, led. And uh, we, we do know a few places, um, and but it, and they're not that far apart. But um, he he was given to obscuring it. He was not the only one doing this. Other other sea captains uh, were doing the same thing. If they found treasure somewhere, they didn't want the world to know about it, so um, they tended to to write about it in a cryptic sense. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, all right. Well, this was how the, you know, the world was beginning to look, you know, once Columbus had visited and, uh, you know, it was changing shape dramatically um, from what Europeans originally thought. And uh, suddenly you, you see the beginnings of North America. Um, uh, uh, South America, Central America, and it, it's recognizable. But Columbus didn't just look at it that way. As I said, he was a complicated character. He tended to bend it to his will. For example, when he got to Cuba, um, he uh, decided this must be part of the mainland of, of you know, of China. Um, so the way to prove or disprove this, of course, was to circumnavigate it. And that can tell you quite easily whether this this was an island or uh, a promontory of a landmass. But he didn't want to do that because he didn't want to hear the wrong answer. The wrong answer being that it was an island. Uh, so he tended to shy away from discoveries that might disprove his long-held uh, theories about the world. You know, when, even before he left. So, um, you know, we're, we're dealing with. With, you know Columbus's imperfections um, as, as a person, and you know they sound well, you know, really dramatic and, and shocking. But you know that's part. It's it, it's hard for people to understand new things and to um, you know wrap their minds around new concepts. And Columbus was struggling as well. He um, was being challenged in a way that other people weren't. So he, he had more to try and process than than the average person or the average. Sailor. Um, next slide, please. Um, this this is how the island of Cuba looked to him, uh, which was kind of kind of a paradise. And in his hopeful way of thinking, this was not an island. This was a mainland, and uh, it would lead eventually to China. Of course, it didn't, and uh, Columbus never never got to China. Any more and any more than he ever suspected that North America existed. So, um, you know, we have this extraordinary phenomenon of a great explorer who was during most of his exploration lost, didn't know where he was, uh, didn't know which end was up. Um, you know, and uh, was bumbling around. Now, you, you can say, well, that's terrible. What it is, what a mess. Uh, this is a fiasco. But this reminds me of a comment um, that I heard. Uh, I was uh, several books before this. I wrote a book about NASA's exploration of the planet Mars. And um, one of the speakers was a um, very senior professor at MIT, Maria Zuber, um, who was giving a press conference. And the the um, reporters there wanted to know what her spacecraft um, expected to find uh, once they got to the planet Mars. And <laughs> what would they discover? And she shot back, if we knew what it was, they wouldn't be discoveries, would they? So, you know, this is what makes Columbus's voyages so exciting because they are unknown and incomprehensible and hard to process. You know, they're new and um, it, it took a long time for people to be able to comprehend uh, what they were seeing and, and what what he did. So I think his uh, confusion is a um, 
an, an indication of his, uh, you know, his extreme <laughs> of his extreme exploring. OK, let's let's go on to the next, if, if you will. Um, the second voyage, um, Columbus's first voyage was considered a success uh, by Ferdinand and Isabella. And in short order, he was sent back, um, you know, to to for a repeat. Um, by the way, he began to change um, during these four voyages and you can track it. Um, he, he goes from the first one, which is rather a pure, if you will, um, and uh, to the, the second and third, where he becomes more and more mercenary. Um, he begins looking for gold. He begins looking for slaves. Um, he begins looking for these, all the evils that we associate with um, the exploitation of uh, indigenous peoples. Um, he also had um, two brothers who were captains that he brought along with him, and they were very capable as well, and they furthered him in his ambitions. So um, the Columbus family enterprise um, looked like it was going to become a, uh, a, a kind of a drain of resources um, on the Caribbean. Um, so next, next slide, please. Uh, these are when I was uh, there, some of the um, uh, places that these are his men who had died, who were, were buried there. Um, and uh, you can you can see there very few people come to visit, but it was it was very stark. Um, Columbus was not interested so much in settling uh, these areas as in uh, noting them and and moving on. Um, next, next. Uh, here's another view of a of a, of a graveyard. Uh, uh, next one. Um, now, this was the vision after Columbus's second voyage of what was going on in the New World. Um, it wasn't idyllic. Um, as you can see, this in, in this really kind of comically grotesque picture, um, it was cannibalism. And uh, you see people roasting body parts um, and eating them. And these kind of very lurid pictures um, spread like crazy throughout Europe. So most people who, many people got a hold of them when they thought of the new world, um, did not think of beautiful islands in the Caribbean. They did not think of potentially uh, very sophisticated, uh, capable indigenous people. Um, they thought of, uh, of savages. And uh, this, this, this was the image that they, they carried around, even though, was, of course, it was uh, completely fiction. Um, and uh, all I can compare it to is some of the distortions that you find on the internet which don't bear much reality uh, connection to reality but you know many people hold fast in their in their mind and imagination um anyway so next next slide please uh okay now in the in the middle <laughs> this is worth a book in itself and there is a book by it, the colombian exchange um it was one of the most lasting effects this is perhaps the most lasting of the four voyages uh, was the transfer of various items um, from the old world to the new and then back and you can see here in this somewhat simplified chart that columbus and his men were bringing um, different kinds of uh, animals, uh, sh sheep, pigs, and horses, um, and grains, wheat, and rice, um, and, and oats uh, to Europe, along with deadly diseases uh, like typhus and smallpox and whooping cough, for which there were, there were of course, uh, no vaccines at that point. Um, in addition, uh, they were bringing along coffee beans and which became very important. Um, and these became important. These took root uh, in the Caribbean um, and, 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 and stayed there. Um, some flourished um, bananas and grapes and citrus fruits. Um, at the same time, um, they were bringing back um, often acid, accidentally, just because it was seeds on they had on their boats, um, 
common uh, uh, Caribbean or uh, American um, items such as uh, pineapples and um, uh, vanilla and especially tobacco, which of course became a very important cash crop um, and peppers and pumpkins. Um, and uh, so turkeys uh, didn't exist um, in the old world until until they, you know, Columbus's men brought them back. Uh, there was no corn. Um, but there was no. To- there were no tomatoes. That meant there was no spaghetti sauce for um, <laughs> for pasta until Columbus's voyages. Um, now, now the, the effects of this Columbus exchange are still being felt today because it's a it's an active. Um, ongoing cycle and in in some ways it's the most important um, element that came out of all these voyages uh, rather than any you know direct political um, uh, implications Um, okay next next slide please All right. Uh, I just want to put this in here. Um, and uh, uh, this is an example of the Columbus exchange of, of pineapples. And uh, they had never been seen in Europe until Columbus brought them back. Uh, there were other fruits as well. And, um, you know, they, they, they were considered kind of marvels. Uh, so he, he was uh, dazzling people as, as well as exploiting people um, on the on this voyage as i said columbus as the voyages go on becomes more and more complicated uh with with more facets uh okay next one please okay third voyage and we'll just keep we can see you can see this is further south uh than the others and um and he is um on the uh, outward bound voyage actually at the northern tip of uh, looks like venezuela there of, of the south american continent so let's 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 keep going with the next slide and uh Venezuela um, became an, an important um, early outpost for uh, Columbus. And again, he was still looking for China and, and unable to find it. And it is kind of extraordinary that he made, you know, the same navigational mistakes over and over. Um, nevertheless, he did. So anyway, next next slide, please. Uh, yes, and he was looking for paradise. Now, he was looking for literally for paradise. He felt that paradise, as described in the Bible, was located somewhere north of Venezuela. I'm not sure how he got that idea, but it was a firmly held idea of his. And um, he uh, so he was sailing around in the waters north of uh, Venezuela, looking for uh, the entrance to it. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, he was also looking for a lot of gold, which he uh, believed was there. And it's not clear where he got this belief, uh, but this was all again in that same sort of uh, favorite spot. Uh, now he um, began to ha- become a little delusional by this point in this third voyage. Um, keep in mind, he was living a very hard, uh, rigorous life, um, and uh, he was suffering from some effects of living at sea a lot. His corneas of his eyes had become uh, burned out from exposure to the sun, so he, he didn't see very clearly. And uh, he was also becoming more subject to delusions. He writes more frequently about hearing uh, the voice of God speaking to him. Well, could call it a delusion or not, but um, he also felt that uh, there were very um, th- th- that he had come come to a special place, and if he could only just find the entrance to paradise, you know, he he he, he would arrive. Of course, he he never did. But the next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of uh, his his men um, 
subjugating some of the uh, locals um, who were there. Um, and while Columbus was in, involved in exploring. Uh, but by this point, his exploration had become exploitation. Uh, and uh, he was, he had lost his original focus on converting people to Christianity um, and was uh, mostly interested in enslaving the people he as as best he could and then getting them to look for gold for him columbus became really obsessed with gold um there wasn't that much gold to be found there was some um, but he had his uh, newly newly minted slaves if you will uh, looking for gold all the time and he wanted to he brought back whenever he went on a return voyage um, as you know a little bit for Ferdinand and Isabella to demonstrate to them uh, the riches of the east which uh were, you know never never as big as as uh, they had hoped to find but uh, gold became an obsession with columbus so as you can see the the focus of his voyage and expo explorations um had had changed or evolved a lot beyond the uh, rather simple first voyage uh, next slide please when, by the time we get to the fourth voyage, uh, which I found fascinating, um, Columbus has been overtaken by his imitators. Uh, there are other um, explorers from uh, Italy and Spain and, and other countries in that area um, who are outdoing him. And they, they've seen what he did. They've, they were following his example. They were going to the New World. They were bringing back... Um, in, an or, in a rather organized fashion, um, you know, all, all sorts of uh, valuable products, uh, in, including gold. Um, Columbus, meanwhile, was becoming ever more uh, the mystic, and he lost the backing of Ferdinand and Isabella. Um, so this was this was a big deal. This voyage, the fourth voyage, um, he backed mostly with his own resources that he had acquired during the three previous uh, closely spaced voyages, and they. Um, uh, uh, so this voyage was in a way the most perilous of his because he didn't he had a very very small fleet um he he went along with his son um, hernando which was a very interesting thing um because hernando later wrote a fascinating account of what it was like to go sailing across the atlantic and exploring with his father columbus and uh, um, hernando uh, was much more scholarly temperament he had no interest in uh, um, slaves or or uh, collecting gold or um, any of these other pursuits of Columbus. Um, he later on uh, owned, it was said, uh, the largest or one of the largest libraries in Europe um, and, and was, was more of a scholar and historian. So his biography of his father, uh, largely based on this fourth voyage, uh, was, was uh, very interesting. And you see Columbus in a kind of broken down state. Um, he is pleading for um, uh, attention uh, wherever he goes. Um, he's considered a has-been by this point. He's in poor health. Um, so the vigor that uh, characterized the earlier voyages is gone. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here, here is the son, uh, Fernand, um, or Hernando. Um, you can get some idea of what he looks like. But his biography of his father is is well worth uh, writing, um, largely because of the voyage that they took together. So anyway, next next slide. Um, okay, <laughs> um, this is the uh, the moon. Um, when uh, Columbus got to the, um, to the Caribbean, he was um, got in danger. He was staying in an island. He wasn't sure which island it was at, but the locals who lived there uh, were menacing and threatening him. And it looked like they were going to kill him and his son um, and any of the other crew members who were there. Uh, Columbus's way of dealing with them showed he was he, he was still had his uh, some of his uh, 
uh, tricks um, or uh, strategy in mind was to explain to them uh, that he was a magician and that he could turn the moon red, blood red. And that would be the end of them. Well, the uh, indigenous peoples there um, were skeptical, but they tended to believe him. Now, how, how could he do this? Well, because he was a very skilled navigator, um, and he knew that an eclipse of the moon was coming up, and it was going to turn red. And of course, they didn't. They weren't. They weren't as sophisticated in navigation as he was. Um, so um, when the uh, the eclipse finally came they decided that this this person who, who had arrived in their midst really did have supernatural powers um and could affect you know not you know the, the tides the planets and who knows what else so uh, they left him alone so with this ruse columbus was able to escape with his life um on, on the fourth voyage but also by that point he was kind of reaching the end of his useful life as an explorer and next slide, please. <laughs> this is a, um, a, a rather uh, uh, romanticized picture of Columbus pointing to the, um, uh, you know, moon turning red and the uh, terrified indigenous people who were, as you can see, prostrating themselves before him um, as he uh, stood there and, you know, uh, looking, you know, all, all wise and powerful. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay. Anyway, that was, well, anyway, some of the books, but uh, that, that's some, some of the information about the voyages themselves. Um, you know, the legacy of Columbus, of course, is really fascinating today more than ever because it's undergone such a drastic uh, reevaluation. Um, even four or five years ago when I was writing this book, you know, it's different than it was today. Um, every day there's, every, every Columbus day, there's, you know, a different uh, perspective. Um, I noticed today uh, that uh, uh, Biden, President Biden, was honoring two holidays, Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day, you know, on the same day. Uh, one, of course, for, you know, traditional Columbus and the other one for, for everybody else who, you know, was uh, on, on the other side. I mean, it's really extraordinary. You could not have imagined this five or ten years ago that there would be, you know, a Columbus Day and its opposite um, at the same time. It's uh it's it's really really rather ex, um, extraordinary so columbus has done as much now or his reputation to divide people as to bring him together i think everybody realizes he has next to nothing to do with you know the idea of america nevertheless we still look at him as our even though it makes no sense there's no reality to it our founding father or you know original um, agent or discoverer in some way um, and it's really just a series of historical accidents as i was writing this book um you know over and over again i was struck by the accidental and irrational quality of how his reputation came together it just it just made no sense um, I mean, he was a brilliant navigator and did, did fascinating things. And that's, that's all true. But it was also, you know, really kind of remarkable and, and puzzling to me. Other voyages and explorers seem much more intentional in Columbus. Columbus seems to have been caught up in a, uh, if you will, a sea of confusion. Um, and so now we're left with a, you know, a reputation, which I think we'll, we'll never sort out. You know, it's, it's always going to be very conflicted so anyway those are a few remarks about columbus and if you have any questions or anything i'll do my best to to answer them thank you thank you so much larry we we don't have much time for questions but if you have a question you can send one in quickly uh you can use the uh, live chat function on youtube the comments function on facebook or you can email me pthompson at stbarts.org those of you who are in person can hand a written question to manny rodriguez leach again we don't have too much time so if you have a question send one in right this second uh, Larry, I wonder if you can just reflect a little more on Columbus and his faith life. It seems to me that in part, 
the tale of Columbus is a tale of kind of Christianity gone wrong, the sort of doctrine of discovery leading him to eventually exploit others. Um, can, can you speak a little more about his relationship to Christianity? Well, I, I think he lost touch with it. I think the younger Columbus was very much in touch with his Christianity, but as he got more and more involved with the potential power, the idea of becoming a ruler uh, of, of some of the lands that he uh, visited, um, he saw, saw it in a different way. So I, uh, he also, keep in mind, his example um, uh, is Ferdinand and Isabella. This was the time of the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, so uh, Christianity was was uh, becoming more and more um, aggressive, and uh, he was uh, looking um, uh, mostly as a way of Christianity to empower what he was doing um, rather than providing uh, guidelines or, or, or guideposts a- along the way. Um, and But that was not unusual. I mean, when so much of what we say about Columbus what was typical of other people at the time. He was not an aberration. His, his beliefs about um, Europe or Christians or non-Christians uh, were, were more or less representative of what most people or especially uh, Genoese uh, thought of that at, at that time. Um, what's interesting is his ability to uh, survive. You know, he was just an extraordinarily hardy soul. I mean, keep in mind, he died in his 50s. Um, he, you know, exhausted. He had completely given himself over to this project. Um, but um, st- still in all, he was, you know, I, I find him a remarkably fascinating figure, even with the very, very um, ugly side and of him. Uh, because, uh, you know, he seems to represent the entirety of a Europeans, uh, of, of Europe's um, uh, imperial aspirations, you know, good, bad, and indifferent at that time. Um, and then some of the accidental um, occurrences like the, the uh, uh, Colombian exchange, you know, which is still with us today is 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 really fascinating because you know he there's few people you could say well they what they did changed the world but columbus is one of those very few people um, you can say that about that his discoveries really changed our understanding of the world Um, this didn't necessarily make him a wise person but it certainly made him a a pioneer and a, a fascinating person just briefly as we end here, could you talk a little bit about Roosevelt and Columbus and, and why Roosevelt uh, yes, yes. instituted sure. This, sure. this holiday in the first yeah. place? This is another, you know, another funny, <coughs> excuse me, um, coda uh, to Columbus. Um, there, there, of course, was a large Italian immigrant population in this country, which was growing and growing. And um, they tended to look to Columbus as one of their heroes or forebears. And there were spontaneous Columbus Day parades around the country in cities like New York and others. Uh, But there was no organized uh, Columbus Day celebration. Franklin D. Roosevelt, um, who was, you know, a supreme politician, realized that there was a block of voters out there um, who could, he could, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) bring into the fold. And uh, so he decided to do that by making Columbus Day a federal holiday, which pleased the um, his Italian American constituents greatly. And, you know, it seems like it's always been there, but it's only since 1937 that there's been a, an official Columbus Day. Of course, now it's, you know, taking all sorts of different forms and is becoming a day of protest as much of as much of affirmation as Columbus. But anyway, it was Roosevelt who really, in a sense, put Columbus on the map. Well, unfortunately, we do have to leave it there. Larry, we are, we're so appreciative of you being with us this morning and, and shedding light on this important and controversial topic. I'm glad to be with you. Thanks a lot. And thank you all for watching. Uh, We hope you'll join us for the forum next week in which a number of healthcare providers from the St. Bart's community will be speaking about healthcare in the age of COVID as we celebrate St. Luke's Day, St. Luke being a gospel writer and physician. We thank you all for being here. We hope you'll also join us for worship in just a few moments at 11 a.m. Take care.